to do, sir. I'm ready to start if you are. I am too. So thank you everybody for joining us today. My name's Adria Bordis. I'm the extension agent in Fairfax County with Virginia Cooperative Extension. And joining me today is my colleague, Mark Suffin, who's going to talk about some updates uh, to our spotted lanternfly pest that is in his county. Um, joining us as well is um, Rachel Grismer and Joanne Allen, and they will be speaking in just a little bit. Um, originally, Joanne and Rachel asked me to speak about spotted lanternfly and give an update as we've been going around the county and kind of giving some updates. But knowing that Mark has had the most firsthand experience with this, in addition to being able to give us some updates of what's going on in the field, uh, we tried to see if he was available and I'm very grateful, Mark, that you were able to join us today. So I ask that everybody, um, if we can just have you all mute your microphone, if not, I will do the honors and then Mark, you go ahead and um, take it from here. Thanks, Mark. Okay, thank you, Adria, and um, I guess if there are questions, feel free to put those in the chat box, and Adria is going to help monitor those, and I've told her she can interrupt me if, if there are pertinent questions that, that we need to stop and answer. Otherwise, we'll try to get to as many um, at the end of the presentation. So, yes, thanks for having me. Glad to be here and glad to uh, continue sharing information and the word about spotted lanternfly. Um, as Adria said, I am Mark Suffin. I'm with Virginia Cooperative Extension. I'm the horticulture agent in Frederick County. Uh, my office is downtown Winchester and I serve a five county region in the northern Shenandoah Valley. And unfortunately, we have the distinction of having the only known population of spotted lanternfly in Virginia. So let's get started. If the screen will advance. There we go. Not sure why my keyboard's not working. Sorry about that. Just want to give some credit to Eric Day and Teresa Dellinger. They are both with um, our Insect ID Lab at Virginia Tech and uh, have really been instrumental in putting this presentation together as well as just a lot of the work and research going on uh, in regards to spotted lanternfly in Virginia especially, but, but in the Mid-Atlantic as a whole as well. Um, I'll start here with the current known uh, areas of distribution for the, the insect. Um, spotted lanternfly is a new invasive insect. It first showed up in Pennsylvania in Berks County near Redding and Allentown, Pennsylvania in 2014. Uh, the pest itself is native to Asia, uh, China, Bangladesh, Vietnam, regions of Asia. In Asia, it has also spread as a pest to uh, South Korea and Japan. So um, it is considered a pest in Asia and unfortunately spread to the United States. Uh, really, this is the only known infestation in North America that you're looking at here again beginning in Pennsylvania 2014 and you can see by the the blue area in the southeastern part of Pennsylvania it has it has spread since 2014 uh, starting in one county and actually there were 12 counties added uh, earlier this spring from from population spread late 2019. Uh, you can see it's also spread into New Jersey into Delaware uh, several counties in Maryland and us here in the northern part, the northern tip of Virginia, uh, Winchester Frederick County. Our population in Winchester Frederick County uh, was discovered to have spread to the east to Clark County and also to the north to Berkeley County, West Virginia. Uh, there were a few adults found in Berkeley County, West Virginia and Clark County, Virginia, 
late 2019. Um, those counties are not yet designated as quarantined uh, because of just, uh, they're under the threshold of established population. The red line designates where there is an internal state quarantine noted by the Department of Agriculture in each state. Um, and also just while we're on this map, you'll see a few counties throughout um, the Mid-Atlantic and uh, New England here with purple dots on them. That is where there has been a transportation intercept or a single insect found, um, maybe dead or alive, that has moved from the known infestation area. And before I go on, I will also mention that I just got word yesterday that there was a population found in Hagerstown, Maryland. So that is just north um, here along Interstate 81 or near Interstate 81 in Hagerstown, Maryland. That's Washington County, Maryland. So uh, we'll be looking for more information about that population, but it does sound like there is um, an isolated find there, or an isolated population there, uh, not, not contiguous with the one here in Virginia. So who knows whether that came from Virginia or whether that came from Pennsylvania. Um, a little bit more about the pest before I talk about where the population actually exists here in Winchester, Frederick County. The pest itself um, is, is is going to be uh, impacting us in numerous uh, facets of of life. Really, it's it's an ag pest, primarily of grape vineyards, and it is also a forest pest because it is known to feed on species like black walnut and maple and others. It will also, or it is also a nuisance pest in the home landscape, um, not only from the feeding on ornamental trees and shrubs, but also uh, just the nuisance factor because they occur in such high, high numbers. And um, as we'll talk about as we go on here, uh, they produce a lot of honeydew and sooty mold. So the population in Virginia began uh, in Frederick County, right on the northern border uh, with the city of Winchester limits. And so we've zoomed in here to the city of Winchester. And in 2018, January 2018, it was first discovered by a Virginia Department of Ag um, plant health inspector. The area was delimited delimited to about a square mile or maybe two square miles. And um, as we stand at the end of 2019, uh, we're over 60 square miles. So um, that yellow square is, is about the, the original uh, infestation area and it has spread um, significantly. Uh, as you can see on this map, we've got a few finds here in Western Clark County, and there were some finds in Berkeley County, West Virginia, near the Bunker Hill area at the state line. Again, we've had some transportation intercepts down here in the southern part of Frederick County as well, and uh, some outliers at the, the regional landfill, um, which we went looking for them there intentionally, thinking that that's a high risk area. Uh, the previous map that I showed you was, was largely finds by reports from citizens within Frederick County and also our volunteers and our volunteer banding program. This map shows um, the efforts of Virginia Department of Ag and all the mapping they've done. Uh, again, these are both 2019 maps. Our 2020 map um, has not really found anything outside of this yet. So we'll get into the insect itself and hey Mark, um, yeah, go as, ahead. As you're talking about the transportation intercepts, there's a question about, you know, how the apple industry has been affected with transportation in and out of the Winchester area, but also intercepts like enforcement, what's the carrier, firewood, 
Can you kind of talk about transportation intercepts, Apple industry and other transportation intercepts? Sure, those are all great questions. And um, so I mentioned when I was showing the map of, of kind of the Mid-Atlantic and, and New England that um, I mentioned quarantine. So Frederick County is in an established quarantine for this pest by Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. And so that impacts um, commercial businesses. Uh, that quarantine does not apply to individuals, but we would ask that individuals um, not knowingly move this insect around and, and practice these same best management practices under the quarantine. But so uh, this insect, spotted lanternfly, uh, which is a plant hopper, it's not a fly, it's not a moth, um, like you, you may think it is with the adult wings wide open and a beautiful insect. Um, it's actually a, a plant hopper, so it's a piercing sucking insect. And it is a good hitchhiker, really, at all life stages. Uh, but the greatest concern would be moving um, a gravid or pregnant female uh, full of eggs or an egg mass. Um, what you're looking at here are some hatching egg masses actually. And so moving an egg mass like that uh, has the potential to start a new, a new population in a new area. And um, again, the quarantine is focused at uh, commercial businesses, really any items um, that have been stored outside fall under uh, items regulated in this quarantine that they have to be inspected before moved outside of, of Winchester or Frederick County. Uh, that also goes for vehicles. Um, so really any modes of transportation are supposed to be inspected. And there is a training uh, to get a permit. You have to go through a training. Uh, Virginia Cooperative Extension helped Virginia Department of Ag develop this. Uh, it's an online training. You get these credentials that you've attended and taken the training and turn that into Department of Ag and they will then issue a permit so that you can self-inspect and also train uh, your employees and coworkers on this insect and, and how to look for it and really, um, yeah, look for it and make sure that you're not moving it with your transportation of commerce. So how it has impacted um, agriculture, to date we have not seen it in commercial ag production in, in Virginia or in Winchester, Frederick County. Um, it, the population began in a heavy industrial area and um, really has largely been seen in industrial and residential areas. Uh, it's on the fringes of some of our ag production and apple orchards. Uh, so we are keeping a close out, close eye out for that uh, this year, 2020, um, just to see if we actually see the pest uh, impacting apples in any way, uh, or vineyard crops or other other ag crops. How it has impacted them, uh, you know, all our farm businesses they are commercial entities, so they they are needing to get these permits and self-inspect, train their workers, et cetera, um, as well. So a little bit about the population or the life stages of, of, of spotted lanternfly. As I said, these this slide that you're looking at now are some egg masses that have, have hatched. Uh, this egg hatch begins typically late April, early May is when we see that. It was um, uh, late April this year is when the first nymph uh, was observed hatching out. They start out as these black and white small nymphs. Uh, there are actually three nymphal stages or juvenile stages that are black and white, really distinguished. Uh, the only distinguished difference between these three stages is just the size, but they're um, a really dark black with a brilliant white spot um, all, all over their spots all over their body and they do not fly at this life stage. They have that head projection as you can see by the red arrow and um, they, they jump. They're good jumpers. They're plant hoppers. I've seen them jump from a standstill uh, easily six to eight 
feet. Um, so they can scatter pretty quickly if, if they feel threatened. Here is uh, these younger nymphal stages. On the, on the left uh, is wild grape. On the right is tree of heaven. Uh, these are really two of their favorite species. Tree of Heaven is their primary host species. Grape uh, really is right in behind Tree of Heaven as a favorite. Um, this is part of the problem as you see how, how much they aggregate together, uh, the, the level of infestation that you can get. And at these younger stages, they really focus on the tender, uh, young, new growing shoots and leaves of, of their host species. We are currently at this life stage. Um, right now, this is the fourth juvenile or fourth instar stage of spotted lanternfly, uh, a little bit larger, upwards of a half inch in, in length for this uh, nymph. And they do not fly either at this stage. In fact, that center photo, you can see uh, the wing pads developing there. Uh, they, this is the stage at which they, they obtain that bright red coloration, still with black and white uh, features on their, mar on the, on their body, body and markings. Um, again, good jumpers and uh, really like black walnut at this life stage for some reason. The photo here on the top right is, is on a black walnut stem. Um, so this is largely what we're seeing right now in our Virginia population in Winchester, Frederick County is this fourth instar stage. We're still seeing some of the black and white nymphs, um, the younger juvenile stage. And uh, Monday of this week, we, uh, the, the first adult was observed by a USDA field team representative, and I've had um, a few residents report adults as well. So we are seeing a range right now in the population of really some second and third instars, the fourth instar, and adults. These are actually some photos taken this week and last week. This is a fourth instar on a wild grape leaf. Uh, on the left is Tree of Heaven, uh, some younger shoots. And you again, you can see the aggregation levels that, that we see with this insect. Uh, the photo there on the right is kind of just a cool photo to show you that's a third, um, that's a fourth instar emerging from a third instar. So it's shedding that black and white exoskeleton. Uh, when they, they first molt, they, they are pretty uh, light colored, white mostly, um, and then start to, to darken into black or red coloration, depending on which juvenile stage they're at. Again, some more photos. Uh, the one on the left was from last week. That's a second nymphal uh, instar at the bottom of this uh, black walnut stem, some thirds there kind of to the upper part of that stem and a fourth on the left side. The photo on the right is actually a photo from 2019. That was the first adult identified in 2019 in the, in the Virginia population. But again, you can see how you can have a range of, of several life stages at one time. Another Mark, photo, yeah. On the on one of your pictures, I think it was maybe two pictures ago. The maybe um, actually need to go forward. Are um, some lesions on the photo, or is that just the bark on the tree? Um, or does that ind indicate any kind of feeding damage that you're seeing? I think those are just lenticels on the on the stem of the black yeah. walnut. Okay, is what yeah. you're seeing. Uh, that actual feeding damage is not yet well understood. Um, and, and unfortunately with a new pest like this, there's just a lot unknown and a lot to figure out. Um, so that's, that's being questioned. Uh, researchers are looking at some feeding damage that they believe may be from spotted lanternfly. And uh, so yeah, stay tuned. To that kind of information. Uh, this is a little bit of feeding damage here in black walnut. I took this photo earlier this week. Um, 
again, the fourth instar really like uh, feeding on black walnut for some reason, and you can see some stress to uh, the tip of that branch. We, that's not uncommon. We'll, we'll see yellowing and even complete uh, death and flagging of, of branch tips in black walnut and tree of heaven has been observed here in the, the Winchester Frederick County area. There's been reports of complete tree of heaven death in Pennsylvania. I think we have seen that as well here in Virginia after multiple years of heavy feeding and also um, uh, vine death in grapes, both in commercial production in Pennsylvania and wild grapes um, in, in the forest and, and natural setting. Where to find them? I've been talking about this. Tree of Heaven is the primary host, uh, really anything in and around Tree of Heaven, you can find them. Um, the, the younger life stages will feed on a pretty broad range, up to 70 plus species of plants. And then they narrow back in. I've been talking to Walnut in the fourth instar, uh, Tree of Heaven the whole time, Grape the whole time. Um, really coming back to Tree of Heaven, the adults and late in the season, we'll, we'll see them almost switch over from Tree of Heaven to things like silver maple, red maple, uh, Virginia creeper is a, is a preferred host much of the season as well. The adults, again, we're just now getting to this life stage currently. You can see them. This is the stage at which they fly. Uh, lots of photos you'll see online often depict them looking like a moth or a butterfly with their wings open. You'll rarely see that in the natural setting. Typically, they're going to hold their wings uh, folded over their back like a, a tent, and you just see that tan outer wing with the, the black spots and bars. Again, some more photos talking about the, the hosts, and uh, that is a black walnut in the right photo, uh, again, showing some stress and damage a few years ago, just from heavy, heavy infestation. Here's some adults. Uh, I believe all these photos are from Pennsylvania. And again, this is, this is what makes this insect um, really a major nuisance in the home landscape. The photo on the left is an ornamental cherry tree. Um, the photo in the top right is a vineyard and the bottom right is tree of heaven. But I don't know many, uh, many individuals who would find this an acceptable situation in their backyard. I've mentioned how these insects are piercing sucking insects, so they are secreting um, as their waste a lot of honeydew um, that, that literally rains down out of the trees. And I'll show you this quick video taken in Winchester last fall of, of some of that honeydew rain. I'll probably play it a time or two here just so you can see it, but you can see upwards of at least 10 streams of honeydew coming out of out of these trees. These are Tree of Heaven, um, Ilanthus trees, and it was just uh, infested with hundreds, probably thousands of, of lanternflies. Um, again, high numbers can occur and aggregate. We don't understand that aggregation and why um, or how they're communicating with one another to aggregate like that. Uh, high numbers can occur. There has been um, some studies that were done in Pennsylvania um, killing the, the insects in a large silver maple tree in which 12,000 adults were dropped out of that tree. So um, again, very high numbers can occur in a single tree. Here's the sooty mold that can develop, that dark uh, coloration occurring on the leaves and the, and the trunk. You can even get white yeast patches and fermentation of that, that honeydew and oozing sap from all those puncture wounds in, in the tree. Um, also with that, that honeydew and um, all of that oozing sap, you start attracting things like bees and ants and wasps 
the the photo on the left though it's poor quality that was here in um, Winchester last fall uh, a resident called um, had actually contacted a beekeeper thinking she had a honeybee swarm uh, he came out investigated and said no you unfortunately have a heavy infestation of lanternflies and all the bees were being attracted to it the the red circles show honeybees and bumblebees um, literally by the hundreds uh, even though you're just seeing the the bottom eight or ten feet of this tree but there there were just high numbers of of bees attracted to this tree uh, again a heavy yeast patch at the bottom of the tree you can see has developed the egg masses um, begin uh, around mid-september we see the females laying those so you actually have several months of adults being around before they they mate and lay eggs and the eggs are are really um, probably the hardest to identify can be laid really on any any flat surface typically a smooth surface that that stays still long enough for the female to lay her eggs on it um, she lays uh, upwards of 30 30 to 50 eggs in, per egg mass in lines as you can see here in this old mat egg mass that's actually emerged um, you can see a few here sticking out and then the female will cover them with with kind of a, a waxy or almost putty like coating looks much like a mud smear um, here on an abandoned tractor trailer you can see quite a few egg masses on the back side of that uh, they start out bright white when they're first laid and as that coating dries it it's an off-white to gray or tan um, even a darker brown as you can see in some of these photos and i'll just go through a few of those to show i know the ones on the bottom side of that branch are difficult to see but that's where we see the majority of them being deposited is on the underside of a horizontal branch seems to be a favorite place for them to lay their eggs um, again give you a sense of size about an inch and a half long by half inch to an inch wide and unfortunately they don't lay them just on plant material and debris but really anything outside pennsylvania reports on lawn for lawn furniture and cushions um, you know buildings and sheds etc a little bit of age progression so you can see how that coating dries and starts to flake off by springtime here's our known host list for virginia i'm not going to go through that extensively but just to show you how wide it is um, again ag forest ornamental species in here uh, pretty pretty wide host range virginia cooperative extension has a host of resources you can find them at this link or if you do an online search for spotted lanternfly virginia or spotted lanternfly virginia tech you'll get to this main page and there is a host of resources there as well as a place uh, this act ask the expert in the center of where you can report a find if you happen to find them um, we are happy to get incorrect finds as well uh, where you can post a photo and we can help you identify what it, what it is if it's not a spotted lantern fly some wallet wallet cards as resources and then um, this slide is just to show you uh, the area that Virginia Department of Ag has been focusing a management plan at um, unfortunately what it seems to be this has been funded largely through the USDA uh, with a partnership of Virginia Department of Ag and Consumer Services and then a third-party contractor to to focus at Tree of Heaven um, smaller Tree of Heavens are being treated with herbicides larger Tree of Heavens are being treated with a systemic insecticide to focus at focus on the fourth instar and adult life stages and and knock the population back unfortunately it seems that uh, funding 
is is very scarce for this program and running out or 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 minimal um, not enough to keep up with the expanding population unfortunately and uh, so we'll see how that goes forward this year and in future years for those in the known population area um, our Virginia Cooperative Extension Pest Management Guide has some information uh, about how to treat and manage in the home landscape and residential setting, as does this publication for residential control of spotted lanternfly in Virginia. And again, that place to report, that's really what we're asking people to do, especially the majority of you who would likely be outside of the known infestation area in Virginia. If you believe you have observed a spotted lanternfly, try to capture a photo of it, try to kill it first actually, and capture a photo and submit that here along with the property address of where it was found. Uh, the best management practices for businesses and the quarantine information is, is listed on this fact sheet offered by Virginia Department of Ag and Consumer Services. So again, you can get to a host of resources either on that Virginia Cooperative Extension page or by doing an online search for um, Virginia Department of Ag uh, spotted lanternfly and you'll get to these resources as well. And we link back and forth between Extension and Department of Ag on almost all of these. A little bit just real quick about some banding. We've been utilizing volunteers and um, I think your Fairfax urban forestry team is gonna talk some about this as well. But these sticky bands are a way to monitor um, especially lighter population areas. Um, the insects, the juveniles, the nymphal stages will fall out or jump out of a tree um, if they're frightened or blown out uh, by the wind and then climb back up the tree trunk. So if you band the tree trunk with this sticky tape, sticky paper, um, you can capture them climbing back up the tree. Uh, a big concern though with these these um, bands is bycatch and you can get insects and even um, small reptiles, possibly birds and other things. So uh, Pennsylvania is really recommending covering these with chicken wire or some other sort of screening material. Here are those bands with some nymphs on the bottom side of that just to see how that kind of works in a lower population area. Uh, catching forth in stars as well. And to help deal with some of that bycatch, we're now really looking at circle traps or modified circle traps, which is kind of a, a funnel um, mesh of screening material with a cup and funnel at the top of it. And the modified one has a larger cup and larger opening. But this helps reduce that bycatch and, and keep some of our vertebrate bycatch out, out of these traps. So with that, I'll stop there, Adria, and it, I know I've gone long, so I apologize, but if there are questions or we wanna go on to the urban forestry team, that's fine by me. I think that right now um, we're gonna transition to Joanne, so I'll have you stop sharing your screen, but in the meantime, while Joanne is bringing up her screen, the, a quick question that I have is, and, and I'm pretty sure that this is the case, I've never heard of Tree of Heaven plants being sold at nurseries. Mark, are you aware of anything like that? Um, These are I just have, wild, wild populations, correct? Uh, Tree of Heaven is an invasive weed species. Um, now it's an invasive weed species. It first came to the United States in the 1700s, um, actually at, for several uses, um, but one being uh, urban urban uh, ornamental trees, street trees, uh, because they tolerate the urban situation so well, compacted soil, terrible sites. Um, so I have not seen them sold in the, the ornamental in industry in my, in my life stage, but um, in, in my lifetime, yeah. One of our coworkers has um, encountered some folks that have had tree of heaven as an ornamental on their property that they have bought from nurseries. I don't know where, but apparently it does happen. Um, this is Jim McGlone. Uh, 
I just quickly searched for Tree of Heaven for sale. Uh, Etsy used 50 Tree of Heaven on eCater, 10 Seeds of Tree of Heaven on Amazon. So it is still out there in the marketplace. <clears throat> Hate to hear that. Yeah, so do I. Oh, I can't hear anybody. Is Joanne still on the line? Yeah, I'm here. Can you okay. Hear? Okay, so are we going to, we're going to transition to Joanne Allen. Joanne, I'm, I'm going to um, let you take the reins here. Or, All right. Uh, all right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Adria. Thank you, Mark, uh, for that very thorough uh, um, explanation of Spotted Lanternfly. I learned a few things. And uh, my name is Joanne. I'm, the, I'm an urban forester with uh, Forest Pest Management. I uh, run the group and uh, we have uh, a mighty team of urban foresters that look out for forest pests. Um, and when possible, we try to manage the the forest pests that we do have in the county. So today what I wanted to do was just explain um, Fairfax County's efforts with uh, spotted lanternfly. As soon as, yeah, there we go. So um, thankfully we don't have any known populations of spotted lanternfly in Fairfax County. So uh, a great deal of our efforts are in early detection. So we're looking for um, primarily, uh, but, uh, sorry, uh, we're looking for Tree of Heaven in within the county. So um, just recently, we didn't really have a very good inventory of Tree of Heaven throughout the county. So it's, it's, it's kind of hard to monitor for a pest if you don't really know where the host trees are. So this winter, we uh, scoured the county. Um, and found significant populations of, of Tree of Heaven. And we focused on areas where there was uh, corridors of transportation and where we knew where people were, a lot of people were moving, especially in, in, in industry. So um, we, we now have a pretty extensive idea of where Tree of Heaven exists, though we can certainly use help from those listening to us today um, and reporting other Tree of Heaven populations that they found around the county. But um, that's, that's a, a great deal of the effort that we're doing right now. Um, we're also setting up, we've started uh, setting up monitoring uh, stations for spotted lanternfly across the county. So um, we have a little over 100 traps that we plan on setting up all around the county and various uh, county properties along the road and, and other places where we, where we think are high risk. Um, so we're going to be doing two different tra trapping methods. Uh, if you look at the right, there's the circle trap, which is uh, we're excited to start using. This is our first year using the circle trap, and we're using those in, in park areas to, to try to limit um, any sort of uh, bycatch, um, like you know other insects or other or other other things that we don't want to catch, and then. We're also trying uh, using the, the sticky bands as well. So we're, we're gonna be checking those every week or two to see if we, if we spot anything. Our hope is to try to catch something early so that um, if there's an effort to try to remove it from the landscape, we can have a, a fighting chance of doing so. So the, the, here are just some areas where we're, we're monitoring for a spotted lanternfly. And uh, how can you help us? So um, please take the, the things that we've, that we've you've learned today from our presentation and, and share it with whoever will tolerate you listening, <laughs> will tolerate uh, you describing all the various uh, informative uh, things that we've learned today. Um, follow the quarantine. So we do have a quarantine in Virginia. Um, so that, that's that, that's especially something that you should share with uh, your loved ones and your friends, um, that they should be uh, careful in traveling to areas, whether it be Winchester or other states that have spotted lanternfly, and make sure that they don't travel with it once they return home or on their travels. So check your car, check your person, um, 
check whatever other accessories that you may have on you. We had uh, uh, someone that we work closely with who helps us with a lot of our outreach materials travel to, um, to Connecticut. And on her way to Connecticut, she found a spider lantern fly uh, in a shopping this area in Pennsylvania and kept that spider lantern fly in a Starbucks cup and then traveled to New York and then traveled back to Virginia unknowingly breaking lots of quarantines. So uh, please just be careful and with, when you travel and let others know to be careful when they're traveling as well. And finally, um, please help us find Tree of Heaven around Fairfax County. Um, we are aware of a lot of the areas that have uh, tr Tree of Heaven, but there, we had limitations on how many areas we can visit around the county. Um, we have lots of other programs going on that, that need our attention. So um, there's a few different ways that you can report Tree of Heaven. Um, if you have access to a smartphone, um, you can use the, the Maiden app, which is uh, run by uh, EdMaps. And you can report Tree of Heaven along with other invasive species. And that, that actually is very helpful for a natural resource uh, agencies like Forest Test in Fairfax County because those reports can help us with many of the projects that we do if other people are reporting invasive species that they see um, while they're out. Um, you can also report it on the EdMaps website or you can just email um, any reports of Tree of Heaven on your property, on, in your neighborhood, or out and about. So, um, and if you do happen to email us, just try to take, uh, try to take a picture. That would be very helpful and make sure the, the picture kind of shows maybe some of the unique characteristics of Tree of Heaven, like some of the pictures I have on my, on my slide here. So that, that's all I have. Um, Adria, are, are there any questions, pressing questions I should answer? Some of the questions were how to report locations of Tree of Heaven, or if you have an active map where current locations of Tree of Heaven are located within the county and how to access that that so um so the currently um my office does not have uh a map available to the public of the tree of heaven locations that we have currently found um we are working with our uh it folks to figure out how to pub how to publicly publish some of the some of the our findings to the public and that's that's an ongoing effort so there's nothing available at least from Fairfax County but if you were to visit EdMaps or visit the Maiden app you can see some of the places where other people have reported those those uh those tests okay or and does the Maiden app give a GPS location I'm trying to remember and I was just trying to bring it up on my phone but that was a question additionally so yes, so the, the way um, it works is um, if you were to report any sort of invasive species on the Maiden app, it then goes to a verifier that shows the verifier um, the specific location. So you can either like point with your finger on the map where it is, or it'll use the GPS technology on your phone to map it, to coordinate it for you. Um, and uh, and then it goes to the verifier and then the verifier either using the, the pictures that are submitted through the app or it actually goes out in the field and, and, and looks at the, at the report to verify whether uh, the invasive species that has been reported is, is that invasive species and confirms it. Okay. And if, and if someone finds spotted lanternfly or tree of heaven and they wanna contact pest mail at fairfaxcounty.gov or anything else, in regards to that, that'll go directly to your office. Yes, so that is something that we regularly check. Um, recently, we had uh, a press release asking folks to look out for Asian longhorn beetle, and we got an amazing response of, of folks uh, of um, various pictures of sightings of longhorn beetles. Thankfully, none of them have been found to be Asian longhorn beetle, so we're all very happy about that, but um, yes. We, and, and anything that you find suspicious that is a forest pest, please feel free to email us at pestmail and we'll be happy to, 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 
to respond to your email. Great, thanks Joanne. <clears throat> Joanne and I work very closely together, so if we get an insect, either one of us comes into one of our emails, we usually share with each other. So next coming up is Rachel to speak next, is that right? Yep, I think so. Okay, thank you Joanne. Am I gonna have, hang on. There we go. You're good. You're good. <laughs> All right, hi everybody. I'm going to be ending our presentation today with how you can identify the tree of heaven or Atlantis altissima. So um, this is a non-native tree to the Americas. It's from China and Taiwan. Uh, it's known by a couple of different names. The most common is tree of heaven or TOH because folks in the forest health and entomology field love their three letter abbreviations like EAB, ALB, TOH, you know. Um, it's also known as Chinese sumac or my favorite stink tree because it really does smell not good. Um, and it was originally brought over to the United States as an ornamental because it is such a hardy tree, grows really well in urban areas and it grows really fast. So where do you usually find it? Tree of Heaven or Atlantis loves disturbed areas. So I don't know if you've ever driven down I-66 westbound or eastbound, but there is a huge super highway of Tree of Heaven all along the medians in between uh, the two directions. Um, so it's pretty common in roadsides, any disturbed area. So where like construction sites, um, or um, I've even seen them in stream restorations happening in Fairfax County. The seeds are dispersed either by birds or waterway, and they just get established where the, the soil has been upturned. Um, and you'll usually find them in clumps, and it's usually a monoculture. It's really unusual to find just one tree of heaven. Where you find one, you'll usually find at least 20 more, but you do have to do, do a little bit of searching usually especially if it's along one of those edge areas or if it's in a disturbed section. So overall, the tree has some of the distinguishing factors overall. They have very large leaves. They're compound leaves, which means they're comprised of multiple leaflets. Um, and it's usually a sparse canopy because those leaves take up so much volume of the canopy. And the branches, especially you'll notice in the winter or fall, they're quite stubby and thick. Um, not many other species will look like that. And it kind of has like a pitchfork or candelabra type um, directionality of growth. So the leaves are probably one of the more distinguishing features. Um, like I said, they're pretty large. They can get anywhere from one to three feet long. Um, and they usually have a terminal leaflet, which means that there's a little leaflet, one of those things that might look like a leaf, but that whole cluster of leaflets is actually one leaf. So Tree of Heaven has a leaflet on the edge of the rachis or that central vein. And you can have anywhere from 11 to 41 of those little leaflets. And on the undersides of the leaves, the un there's a, an odor gland that when it's disturbed kind of smells like burnt peanut butter. I think that's the nicest way to describe it. Um, unfortunately, it kind of makes me dry heave. It's really gross. So that's a pretty easy way to determine if you've got tree of heaven, just kind of mush the leaves and it'll smell bad. Hence the name stink tree. So, and those little glands are located on what I like to call thumbs. The entirety of those leaf mar or the leaflet margins are smooth with the exception of like two little teeth on either side. And those you can see in the bottom two images um, and underneath each one of those little teeth or thumbs is one of those uh, glands. The bark, it's one of the few tree species in our area that has smooth bark, both as a young tree and as a mature tree. Um, but it is textured once you get closer up to it. And it's a couple of, Easy ways to recognize it is it kind of looks like cantaloupe skin, especially when the tree is young and maybe be more maturing into something that looks like weathered concrete. And you might also be able to see something that looks like lenticels or like diamond shaped patterns, um, diamond shaped lenticels on the bark. 
One of the reasons that this tree is so successful is that it is a prolific seed producer. Um, a female tree can produce up to 300,000 seeds per year. And um, those seeds are very uh, uh, spreadable. So they can be blown away, they can be carried by animals, um, can be in the back of a bed of a truck and drive down the highway kind of thing. Um, but the, the trees are dioecious, which means that there are female trees and there are male trees. The female trees produce the seeds, the male trees do not. So part of the management strategy that we want to focus on is removing those uh, female trees to reduce the possible um, spread of tree of heaven. So the seeds are samaras, similar to something like an ash tree or a maple tree, but they are single winged and they can be either bright green or bright yellow green to this lovely orangey red color and they hang on the branches or, or they're pendant on branches. And sometimes you'll see them in the later seasons like fall and winter as being like a black or brown type um, fruit hanging on the trees and th that, those are just the ripe seeds that haven't fallen off but usually they will kind of self disperse. The twigs. In my opinion, it, this is a pretty distinctive tree in terms of all of its characteristics, but the twigs in particular for me are one of the, the best ways to tell. Um, number one, they're stubby and thick, and the leaf scars, which are the kind of whiter portion where there was a leaf last year, are very large and heart-shaped, and the bud kind of sits on top of that leaf scar. And if you carry around a pocket knife with you, which is pretty good practice, and you slice open the um, <clears throat> the twig, you'll kind of see this creamy type of substance in the middle. Um, according to my mother, she used to live in Detroit, uh, she and her friends would eat that stuff and she said it tastes like peanut butter. Um, I can't verify, I wouldn't recommend it, but if you wanted to try that, that could be an option for you. Um, and one of the other things that I noticed, an another kind of disgusting feature with Tree of Heaven, is when they're first leafing out in the season, early in the season, those leaves are so big and they grow so rapidly at the top, it kind of looks like a dirty Q-tip, so. Okay, Tree of Heaven is not the only um, pinnately compound tree in this area. There are a couple that I'm gonna talk about um, and then I'll review a couple more at the end of the presentation. <clears throat> the primary one that you will likely be confused by is black walnut. That is a native tree to Virginia and the United States. And it's an alternate branching pattern, but one of the features, again, good reason to carry a pocket knife. If you split the twig open, you'll see a chambered pith. And I'll show you a picture in the next slide. The, both the leaves and the fruits, they have kind of a spicy smell. And um, if you look underneath the tree, you will usually see the, like the tennis ball looking black walnuts somewhere around it. Um, the leaves are again pinnately compound, but it does not have a terminal leaflet. It's smaller than the Tree of Heaven leaves with 10 to 24 leaflets and up to two feet long instead of up to three feet long. And the bark, unlike Tree of Heaven, is almost always furrowed or rough, even when the tree is young. So here's some closer examples of those three features that I talked about on the, on, what would it be, your left? Your left is the bark with those diamond-shaped furrows. The center is that distinguishable chambered pith or those little, little holes inside of the inside of the twig. Um, and then the compound uh, leaves without the terminal leaflet on the right. And again, this is what you would see if you're looking up at the canopy. Again, no terminal leaflet. And the leaflets themselves are finely serrate, which means they have um, really shallow teeth along the outside of the whole leaflet. Sumac. Now, there are multiple species of sumac in this area, but I'm going to just talk generally about sumacs. Um, I believe the one I have here is a staghorn sumac, um, but you can look at the specific um, features of the different species on your own. Um, sumacs will have, again, that compound leaf, but the leaflets will be serrate. Um, so it has a more coarsely serrate pattern than something like a black walnut. 
um, and they usually also have a terminal leaf leaflet. So if you're keeping track, sumac and tree of heaven both have the terminal leaflet. But with sumac, the twigs are always fuzzy. Sometimes with tree of heaven, you get a, um, a young twig that might be fuzzy, but it doesn't persist. With sumac, the fruits, instead of hanging down, they're usually upright in this kind of cone shape and they're bright red. And the leaf scar, I don't have a good way to describe what that shape is, but it's not heart shaped and the bud kind of sits inside that leaf scar. Okay, let's do a quick summary. First of all, that picture on the bottom right, I want you to try and guess which one that is while I'm talking. So overall, Tree of Heaven, these are all gonna be compound leaves. So that means that those leaves are comprised of leaflets. Um, the Tree of Heaven is the largest with being one to three feet long. And when crushed produces a foul odor because of those glands on the undersides of each of those leaflets on the thumbs. And the bark is pretty consistently smooth and gray, even when it's young or old. With black walnut, you again have the compound leaf, but it's a little bit smaller, kind of in the intermediary range, one to two feet long, usually fewer leaflets as well. And the leaflets are finely serrate, so it almost might look like it's smooth or entire unless you really get up close to it, but this one does not have a terminal leaflet. The bark will consistently be uh, a fissured gray or black with like diamond shaped plates. And then sumac is gonna be probably consistently the smallest, both in overall size of the tree and size of the leaflets. Um, it ranges from one, and a half, one to one and a half feet long for the leaflets. And you'll notice the, the upright conical shaped red fruits. And those leaflets again are going to be serrate instead of an entire, they don't have those thumbs and they don't smell bad. So, some others you might encounter. Uh, green ash, that's, that's a pretty common one that has kind of a similar stubby branch pattern, also kind of looks like a pitchfork if you're looking up into the canopy without leaves on it. But green ash is opposite, and um, tree of heaven is not. Um, box elder is another one, that's a species of maple. Um, similar kind of weedy growth, but it has those double wing samaras, and the leaves are quite a bit smaller. Polonia, which is another invasive tree, is pretty similar, especially without the leaves in the wintertime. Um, but the, the leaf scars and the, obviously the leaves are much, much different than um, Tree of Heaven because it's a simple leaf. So feel free to leave your guesses for what that bottom right picture is. And I'm going to talk about what you guys can do to help us. So we, I know we got a couple of questions about the Maiden app and any sort of other crowdsourced type identifications. Um, I believe we're working on coming up with something for iNaturalists, but our default database is using the Mid-Atlantic Early Detection Network or Maiden. And you can start to uh, record your sightings of Tree of Heaven going to edmaps.org and then registering an account like I have in, uh, in the, the publication here. So this, this picture that I have on, on the screen is something that um, if you would like as a, a handout can be printed for you. It's also going to be available on our website soon. But all we ask is that you please include pictures. It makes our job incredibly easier because if we can see something, for example, that doesn't have a compound leaf, we know right away that's not tree of heaven. Or if the bark looks completely wrong, we can rule that out right away and save us a field trip. So. If you can help us by including more pictures, we would really appreciate it. But I understand that not everybody wants to go to EdMaps or they don't want to use a mobile phone. So you're welcome to always email us your reports, like Joanne said, to pestmail at fairfaxcounty.gov, or you can even call the Urban Forester of the Day and they will get you routed to the right place. So that's all I have. I think I was a motor mouth and went way too fast, but um, that gives us plenty of time for questions. Right, Adrian? Yes, thank you, Rachel. You did an excellent job. And again, pestmail at fairfaxcounty.gov is a great way to get in touch with the urban foresters that you're talking with here today, Rachel and Joanne. 
they're excellent partners of Cooperative Extension. Mark and I are really grateful that you started off, kicked off your uh, your your series. Um, but we have we have an opportunity for questions in the chat box if anybody um, has questions. Um, go go ahead. I know that there was um, a comment that Jim made that a lot of the female. Um, trees are full of seeds already. Yes, I've noticed that too. Um, they, they put out seed pretty early in the year, um, so they have the whole season, the whole summer and fall to spread everywhere. Um, do you know, do you know what age the, the flowers, the, um, they start to have uh, produce flowers, the, the trees? That I'm not sure. I would have to look it up and get back to you. Okay. I don't have my iPad. Um, Avery, the, the first speaker, I've, I've forgotten his name, that, that comes with old age. Um, mentioned at the beginning of his briefing that um, the, these insects were not flyers, they were hoppers. Um, and yet later on in the briefing, he I think he pretty well suggested that they're flying. So uh, is that a synonym for hopping or, or did I misunderstand it? Um, I, I can jump in, Mark. Adria. Um, Mark. I, I was saying they're not flyers in the juvenile stages. So the four nymphal stages do not, do uh, not fly. The okay. adult stage is the only stage in which um, spotted lanternfly actually flies. Got so, it. Thank so, you very much. Sorry about that. No worries. All right, so there's another question here. Um, using biological herbicides to control ailanthus um, and how to eradicate ailanthus. I know that there is some work being done with verticillium and other um, biological controls. Uh, what kind of knowledge do we have with that, Mark and Joanne? Um, well, I, I was recently uh, discussing this project with Dr. Salem out of Virginia Tech. He and others uh, are part of a team that are working on this uh, bioherbicide along with a, uh, a manufacturer, a pesticide manufacturer. So currently uh, they're in the demo phase of their, of their project. So they have to go through uh, an extensive EPA review um, before they're able to make this uh, make that product commercially available. So um, they are, they have a, a couple different demo sites out there. Fairfax County may be one of the demo sites where we're working with them to try to find a, a good site for them. And uh, it'll, it'll probably be still a little while before that, that product is available. But from what I have read and presentations I've seen, it, it it's a very, uh, it's a very good uh, potential out there because currently um, for, for trying to get rid of Tree of Heaven in the landscape, it's, it's very uh, labor intensive. And so you have to go out and do the stuff, uh, cut, oh, what's it called? Someone help me. What's hack and squirt? Hack and squirt. Hack and squirt. <laughs> <laughs> the hack and squirt method. And so you often have to retreat the same area over a, a long period of time. And so with the verticillium bioherbicide, bio uh, the prospect is you would treat potentially just a few individual stems with the bioherbicide and through root grafts, the verticillium would spread to other trees in the surrounding area and potentially kill a stand of tree of heaven within a matter of a few years. Um, so that, that, would, that would reduce the labor of, of getting rid of tree of heaven in, in, a, landscape, in, in a landscape significantly. Uh, Joanne, we've had some experiences where we've been treating with uh, more conventional herbicides, but we didn't get all the stems. And apparently the...